Georgetown University is committed to standards promoting speech and expression that foster the exchange of ideas and opinions. While it is recognized that not everyone may share the same views as the speaker, it is expected that everyone in attendance at this event respects the rights of the speaker and the organizers to share their perspectives and ideas by not causing a disruption to the event's activities. At the conclusion of each panel, there will be a question and answer session during which you may ask questions and engage in dialogue. Please be sure to phrase your comments in the form of a question. In the interest of time, we ask that each person be concise and ask only one question. Please welcome Dr. Joseph Sassoon to the stage. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming here on behalf of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, the George Mason uh, University Middle East and Islamic Studies program and the Arab Studies Institute to mark the 20th anniversary uh, of the U.S. invasion. Uh, we hope to have really a fruitful discussion ex exposing the different aspects of the invasion throughout the day, uh, culminating with a movie on, on Baghdad. And I will pass it now to uh, my co-chair, uh, Bassam Haddad. I was worried there was no applause. <laughs> Can you all see me behind the podium? That's good. Um, Good morning, everyone. Thank you, um, Joseph, for the introduction. Uh, this is a, a remarkable feat that has been in the planning for some time between the uh, organizations that uh, Joseph addressed. Uh, I will be moderating uh, this event. Uh, this is a very uh, important uh, moment for all of us, but it's also especially important for those of us who have been at this institution for many, many years, including uh, people on this panel and other panels, uh, myself included. Uh, this is our 31st year that we've been with this uh, center, Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University, which has uh, produced so many of the people that we read, watch, and listen to uh, over the decades. Um, I will say a few words about the uh, invasion of Iraq, and then I will introduce the panelists. I will provide a short introduction before each panelist, and uh, you may look at the catalog for further information. We will have a Q&A period right after. Each speaker will speak to, for about 12 to 13 minutes. 20 years ago, the United States embarked on what is arguably the boldest action of imperialism in the 21st century, destroying almost an entire country and doing so on fraudulent ground, simultaneously combining untold brutality with unprecedented hypocrisy considering the discourse on democracy the United States espouses in its foreign policy. That was the invasion of Iraq, not the war in Iraq. As more than 70 years of engagement in the region demonstrates the United States' support for, re for repressive, brutal, and reactionary regimes, including that of Saddam Hussein before he fell out of favor, has not ceased or subsided until this day. Bypassing all empirical data and common sense, we still witness today celebratory speeches and articles about the barbaric invasion of Iraq in 2003, which in some fantasy land is viewed as a sea change in the region. In my writing over the years, I have characterized the invasion as the Big Bang because it set in motion a number of other developments that burgeoned into their own calamities. For instance, the development of ISIS in Syria based on the oxygen some groups who were based in Iraq were able to breathe next door as Syria experienced its uprising in 2011. There are other examples. I will not belabor the points here, as we have an illustrious panel of stellar speakers who will be taking the floor momentarily. It is difficult to understand the full extent of the war on Iraq. And it's also difficult to, extend, to explain or understand the complexity of the Syrian uprising. But with the Syrian uprising, it is important that without the Iraq effect, it becomes even more difficult to fathom what took place in Syria, which goes beyond the creation of ISIS. Similarly, it is impossible to understand the emergence of ISIS and its predecessor, the Islamic State, just the Islamic State, IS, without the benefit of the US invasion. I share these because they are important in the collective unconscious of many people here in the United States. <clears throat> 
Still until this day, even detractors of the war on Iraq, or many of them, lament the fraudulent war not because it was illegal, immoral, unjustified, but because it was not good for the United States' interests, the only reference point there is, leaving millions behind in squalor, including the young American soldiers sent to die needlessly. Whether it is the untold human toll, the colossal infrastructural destruction, the environmental calamities, or the degradation of more than a generation of Iraqis, the war is not only unique because of its effects, it is also unique in the sense that it comes after more than two decades, some say more, of war, invasions, and sanctions. The U.S. also takes the prize here as it led or was involved in all these events, developments, and policies. It backed Saddam Hussein in a senseless and costly war with Iran, where we were content to see both parties degrade and destroy each other, as Kissinger said. It led the international coalition in beating back the horrendous Iraqi occupation of Kuwait, after which it urged an uprising in the south against Saddam Hussein, only to abandon that uprising and leave the protesters as prey to Saddam's air force, resulting in the notorious mass cemeteries. Finally, the U.S.-led sanctions were among the most brutal in modern history, leaving hundreds of thousands of Iraqis to squalor and many most to die needlessly while toothless Saddam was building dozens of palaces in peace. It is then that Iraq was battered and bludgeoned in 2003. The misery doesn't end and Iraq does not have much to show 20 years on as evidenced by the seemingly often irredeemable status quo or many parts of it as we can observe today. There are glimmers of hope to be sure, as we will witness during the panel on culture in Iraq, the next panel. This panel is not going to be uh, uppity, I think. <laughs> we meet today to commemorate that moment, so we may never repeat it again at the expense of everyone else. Let me start by introducing our first speaker and my longtime friend, if I may say also my soulmate, uh, Sinan Antoun. Uh, Sinan was born in Baghdad in 1967. He left Iraq after 1991, the 1991 Gulf War. He holds degrees from Baghdad, Georgetown, and Harvard, where he earned his doctorate in Arabic literature. Uh, I will cut the uh, uh, introduction short because it's quite long, as I promised. Uh, Sinan Antoun is uh, identified in our booklet as poet, novelist, translator, and scholar, and also filmmaker, as we will be showing the film that uh, Sinan co-directed along with myself and three others of our colleagues. Please help me welcome Sinan Antoun. Thank you so much, Bassam. It's, uh, on the one hand, it's, it's lovely to be back here at Georgetown. As Bassam said, this is where we learned so much, and it's uh, it's an honor to be with with these friends. Uh, it's it's but also bitter because of the occasion. Um, and 12 minutes for 20 years and more and 1 million lives. So where to begin when it comes to Iraq? Beginnings are of crucial importance if we are to understand the manner in which history's master narratives are constructed, or if we are to critically examine how events are strung in a certain order and how epochs are framed and what meanings are ascribed to their order. Equally important are the strategies and tropes deployed to ensure the erasure and silence of other histories and narratives and to muffle the voices of those who once inhabited them. My interest in frames of life and death stems from being haunted by those whose lives are already outside the frame and hence their death is not registered and is not even grievable. Do wars ever come to an end? This is not a rhetorical question. They do end for the politicians and for the pundits, for the perpetrators and participants in wars. Well, not all participants, as Bassam mentioned, soldiers return with their own wounds, traumas, and ghosts. I, however, am more concerned with civilians, be they in Iraq or elsewhere in the countries that are suffering, the terrorism of the war on terror, and actually, <laughs> What the U.S. did in Iraq is terrorism, uh, pure and simple. 
Wars don't come to an end for civilians. They go on and are still ongoing in various visceral ways, whether in the lethal effects on their bodies and the bodies of their loved ones who lie in graves, in the scars on their bodies and their psyches, in the destruction of their homes and cities and of their social spaces and social fabric, in the obliteration of infrastructure and institutions that took decades to build in the toxicity delivered by smart weapons in the environment and deposited for thousands of years to come, and in the genes of unborn humans. I am referring in this last sentence to the use of depleted uranium by the United States in Iraq back in 1991 and 2003, and the use of white phosphorus in Fallujah. And I'm sure you know that the new amphibious ship has been named Fallujah uh, in this country. Um, this, this conference is taking place in the United States of Amnesia. The American poet Adrian Rich wrote once that, quote, in America we have only the present tense. In the same vein, the great Toni Morrison added that, quote, the past is absent or is romanticized. This culture does not encourage dwelling on, let alone coming to terms with the truth about the past. With a few exceptions, this is still the case, and this applies to this continent's history and how it fails to come to terms with its congenital crimes, as well as to what the United States does on other continents. When it comes to Iraq, not only to the invasion that took place two decades ago, but to an earlier war, that of 1991, which is completely forgotten, never even mentioned. While the theme of today's event is the Anglo-American invasion of Iraq, that, to my mind, was Act 3 in the destruction visited on Iraq. Act 1 was the 91 Gulf War. The daily bombing that began in 1991 and started on January 17th and spread all over Iraq. Of course, the declared objective was driving the occupying army, Iraqi army, out of Kuwait, which it had invaded in August 1990. But the bombing resulted in the destruction of Iraq's infrastructure. 134 bridges. 18 of Iraq's 20 power generating plants, industrial complexes, oil refineries, sewage pumping stations, and telecommunication facilities. I mention all of these because so-called experts and others are baffled by what happened to Iraq later. Post-war electricity was reduced to 4% of pre-war levels. The economic loss of the 43-day bombing campaign was estimated by UNICEF to be $232 billion. The American-led coalition dropped 88,000 tons of bombs. That is equivalent to seven Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. And Act Two, as Bassam mentioned, was the genocidal sanctions imposed on Iraq from 1990 to 2003, draining the country's resources and its economy, driving three million of its citizens to the diaspora. Joy Gordon, in her excellent book, Invisible War, the United States and the Iraq Sanctions, mentions how a UN envoy described the situation in 1991 as near apocalyptic. The best estimates of excess child mortality, the number of children under five who died during the sanctions, who would not have under Iraq's economy and policies before the sanctions, is between 670,000 and 880,000. And I'm sure most of you know of Madeleine Albright saying the price was worth it. Now to Act Three, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and we should always think and be mindful of the terminology, it has become for all intents and purposes the Iraq War, as if the war waged itself and somehow landed in Iraq. The perpetrator is absent. The pundits and scribes who played their dutiful part in Empire's Wars chorus in the run-up to the war are still out there dispensing wisdom ad infinitum. And by the way, lest we forget, many of those who supported the war were not from the right or our usual neocons, but did so from elite liberal platforms. For example, the great New Yorker's editor, David Remnick, wrote, quote, history will not easily excuse us if by deciding not to decide, sounding Rumsfeldian there, we defer to reckoning with an aggressive totalitarian leader who intends not only to develop weapons of mass destruction, but also to use them. A return to a hollow pursuit of containment will be the most dangerous option of all. This was 20 years ago. But last week, we still read in the New York Times headlines describing Iraq as freer, 20 years. So much so for learning, since we're in a learning institution. 
20 years after the invasion, Iraq is a freer place, but not a hopeful one. And Brett Stevens wrote that he does not regret supporting the Iraq war. So empire scribes will continue to do what they do and will view the world in colonial terms. We live in a settler colonial state after all, so it is no wonder that Iraq is in military nomenclature Indian country. You can look it up. They refer to Iraq as Indian country, meaning lawless, uncivilized. And this has to do the way a lot of Americans see others has to do with how they see their own country. The colonial frame and embedded notions of white supremacy explain how most military or civilians can rationalize, make sense of, or simply ignore what the United States does abroad and in Iraq. Iraq was another frontier between the forces of an advanced and well-meaning civilization and a hostile and violent culture ungrateful for what was offered and burdened by its violent past. And you see how this is, it's so ingrained in the culture that a film that is pro-war, like uh, The Hurt Locker, was celebrated as an anti-war film. It's actually a pro-war film, but this is the gap that we have to deal with. I want to briefly turn to epistemic violence and turn to Iraq, in, in Iraq, not in this country. Forms of epistemic violence were already, I believe, being perpetrated against Iraqis throughout the decade of the 90s during the sanctions, which isolated most Iraqis from the world, deprived citizens from access to knowledge and vital resources. And there is no doubt that 2003 marked a new phase of intense epistemic violence in the context of knowledge and cultural production in and about Iraq. While considerable attention was devoted to the actual destruction caused by the invasion in 2003, especially during the initial chaotic phase, particularly the loss in libraries, manuscripts, collections, archives, and museums, and more recently to archaeological sites with the rise of ISIS, very little attention has been devoted to epistemic violence, which is a direct result of the material damage, but not always as easily locatable and identifiable. The modes of a constitution and production of knowledge in and about Iraq and how these are shaped or even overdetermined by a constellation of factors should be addressed. And attention to epistemic violence means understanding the ways in which it had become difficult, if not impossible, to imagine, reconstitute, and study certain Iraqs and notions of Iraqiness. Um, the occupation, the, the, the institution, sorry, I am speaking so fast to be within the 13 minutes. Um, 2003 marked the beginning of the institutionalization and dissemination of various forms of epistemic violence by the occupation and the political system it designed and installed. The official imposition of ethno-sectarian discourses through which the sense of Iraqiness and national belonging is further fractured and fragmented, and Iraqis are incited and encouraged to imagine and organize themselves as members of sects and ethnicities first and foremost. The introduction of ethno-sectarianism as the primary currency and signifier into Iraqi politics, cultural production, educational and academic spheres, not to mention the cultural violence and destruction, the looting of artifacts, artworks, and archives. I have written elsewhere about the Iraq Memory Foundation and the plunder of state archives and transferring them to the Hoover Institute at Stanford, as well as the recent, more recent scandal of the New York Times reporter plundering Iraqi documents during the Battle of ISIS. There was plunder of Iraq's ancient artifacts, and the chaos of the occupation created the material condition for another form of plunder. Hundreds of paintings by modern Iraqi artists left Iraq via global networks to be displayed on the walls of the affluent or in museums not far from the bases from which US aircraft took off to bomb and create the destruction and chaos that liberated these objects from Iraq and accelerated their journey far away. You know about Paul Bremer's use of communal affiliation as the organizing principle for allocating seats on the Iraqi governing council. It's become a joke, but you know, the, the, uh, the Secretary General of the Iraqi Communist Party had to be included because of the constituency that the Iraqi Communist Party had in Iraq and its history of resisting Saddam's regime, but he was included as a Shi'i, not as a communist. Um, the sectarian parties, sponsored and supported by the United States and the United Kingdom and, and Saudi Arabia and others returned from their exiles in London and Tehran where they had already started to cultivate a sectarian outlook and language. 
emboldened by their sponsors and the new political system where sect and ethnicity were the only political currency. Their media outlets, and this is very important, newspapers and satellite channels disseminated the language of sectarianism and division and fueled the fires of hatred inside Iraq. In the first decade or so after 2003, many Iraqis, sadly, including writers, journalists, and other active in the cultural production, in cultural production, internalize and reproduce the discourses, tropes, and categories of this so-called new Iraq, the Iraq al-Jadid, and inhabited new subject positions, rarely casting doubt on its legitimacy. They would call the whole thing an amaliya siyasiya. And of course, any resistance or critique of the political process was that you're either a Ba'ath supporter or you're a terrorist. And these are the fruits of the discourse of the war on terror. The moment of hope, however, for many of us came in 2019, the massive protests that erupted in Baghdad and other cities in Iraq on the first day of October of 2019 later evolved into a full-fledged uprising that spread throughout the country. It was a unique and monumental event in the country's history. It also showed that despite the onslaught of sectarian discourse, and perhaps because of it, a new generation of Iraqi youth had rejected the entire political premise of the post-2003 regime, as well as its symbols, culture, and language, and survived and resisted epistemic violence. The sense of despair and disappointment the protesters felt and their desire to reclaim Iraq was crystallized in the main chants, we want a homeland. And also one of the early slogans hung on the Turkish rest restaurant in Tahrir was no to America and no to Iran, which is very, very significant. Most of these protesters were young Iraqis who came of age in the wake of the Anglo-American invasion. The so-called political process, mischaracterized as a democracy by pundits and journalists in the global north, and Iraqi journalists of older generations who internalized and parroted the post-2003 discourse. This process cobbled together a failed state that is incapable of providing the minimum prerequisites for a dignified life for average Iraqis, but is one of the most corrupt states. And the figures of the, of the corruption and the money that disappears are astronomical. These young protesters lived under this system their entire lives and incurred the heaviest of losses. They were soon joined by syndicates, unions, and there were strikes in universities, colleges, and schools. It seemed to signal a new beginning and what some thought the beginning of the end of the 2003 system, which had lost its legitimacy in the eyes of most Iraqis. A new sense of national belonging was being articulated with creativity and resourcefulness. The protesters were also reclaiming a non-sectarian past and drawing on indigenous revolutionary symbols and narratives. Sadly, and this is the theme of this last decade, they were crushed brutally by the very same regime that the United States installed in Iraq. Yet, in recent uh, reports, some Iraqis were saying, well, at least we have the peaceful tadawul uh, silmi sulta the peaceful, but it's of course the peaceful tadawul uh, for the mafias that control the country. I don't have any more time, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Sinan, for <laughs> your insights. I'm sure we will hear a lot more during the Q&A period and in the uh, other panels today. At this point, I would uh, like to introduce our next panelist, Professor Rochelle Davis. Rochelle Davis is the Sultanate of Oman, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the Center of Con for Contemporary Arab Studies in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Her research focuses on refugees, war, and conflict, particularly in Palestine, Syria, and Iraq. She is currently writing a book on the role of culture in the U.S. military occupation of Iraq. Thank you. Rochelle. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you to the organizers for inviting me and for the panelists for, for sharing all of this with us. And it's phenomenal to follow um, Sinan Anton, um, who is not only legendary, but um, he, without any coordination, he sort of, um, he and I are gonna be talking about similar things. Um, I do wanna start by acknowledging that we are on the unceded lands of the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples and that our university, as well as this country, was built in part by the labor and sale of enslaved peoples. 
I've been researching the subject of the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq since really 2006 when I came to Georgetown. And I'm completing a book manuscript on the topic, and that's the title I've chosen so far. Uh, my research focuses on the cultural training the U.S. military provided to its soldiers, Marines, airmen, and seamen about Iraq, Iraqis, Arabs, and Muslims. And in my 12 minutes today, I'm going to offer a brief analysis of American and governmental knowledge production about Iraq and how soldiers understood this material within the context of their deployments and their, um, and their jobs. In other words, how did they make sense of the information provided to them about Iraqis, and how did they understand the cultural information along with the stated reasons for the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq, which were as George Bush said on March 22, 2003, quote, to disarm Iraq of weapons of mass destruction, to end Saddam Hussein's support for terrorism, and to free the Iraqi people, unquote. Many writers and scholars detail policies and practices and its outcomes. But I undertook this project in part because I'm an anthropologist and, and I thought it was important to understand how those policies and practices were carried out by soldiers on the ground and in, in, in other ways in how power was manifested. And I'll use my slides to um, sort of tell some stories and provide the sources for what I've um, been thinking about and working with that I don't really have time to do in words. Um, <clears throat> These are my, some of my intellectual inspirations and uh, theoretical material. Uh, but my primary sources for this uh, analysis include 10 years collecting publicly accessible cultural training material for U.S. troops, along with almost 90 interviews with U.S. soldiers, as well as 50 interviews with Iraqis. I analyze this material along with government and military policy documents, memoirs, autobiographies of U.S. soldiers, as well as the media and cultural production in the U.S. and Iraq. My analysis remains rooted in U.S. policies and politics of empire, which enable the U.S. government and military to have this power to define what is Iraq and Iraqi culture par parallel with the ability of the U.S. to engage in violence to achieve its policy goals. This U.S. military knowledge projection about other countries has a long history, and since World War II, the Department of War, and now, which is now the Department of Defense, has published handbooks and pamphlets to instruct soldiers about the countries where they are posted, whether they were occupying forces or, or posted on military basis. These types of informational handbooks continue to be produced in the present. And from 2003 to 2005, there was very little cultural training material uh, for uh, soldiers going to Iraq. And what existed was neither systematic nor even accurate. They were often based in the very popular understanding of Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations thesis, in which the West was at odds with Islam, and on colonial era civilizational hierarchies, as I'll show throughout the rest. Um, <clears throat> the U.S. military often outsourced these tr uh, trainings to contractors who created computer-based trainings in culture and language, who staffed and created scenarios for mock Iraqi or Afghan villages situated on American bases in, in the U.S., who developed um, many PowerPoints um, and other types of training material, and, who, and they also developed the human terrain system, among other ways to turn a kinetic fighting force into a counterinsurgency force, which came into being in around 2006. From soldiers' descriptions of their experiences with Iraqis and comparing it to the cultural training material that was available at the time, it is clear that the information that was communicated set a framework for thinking about Iraqis and Arabs and Muslims that gave the soldiers ways to understand what they saw, even as some of those understandings were wrong. And the majority of the soldiers I interviewed who had received cultural training between 2002 and 2007 thought that the training was not useful. Um, and yet, while the cultural training bore little reality to what they experienced on the ground, I saw through the interviews that they used that training to articulate their experiences within a vocabulary that made sense of their mission and to the reasons that they were sent there as American soldiers. And I'm going to focus just on Iraqi identity um, as it appears in the cultural training material and, the, and public and governmental sources because that's all I have time for. Many of you will uh, know about the Iraq Culture Smart Card, and I think it's a good case in point. It was compiled by the Air Army and Marines, as well as the contractors Quick Point and SAIC. It was sized for the pockets of servicemen and women in the field, with over 1.8 million of them requested and distributed as of 2006. It was first produced in 2003 and then reprinted and reformatted as late as 2009 with the same wrong information. Um, and the 16-panel guide had at least eight panels describing cultural, religious, uh, cultural and religious information about Iraqis as well as historical information. <clears throat> I want to focus <clears throat> on how 
<clears throat> these the culture smart card sorry about that um, really kind of frames a way to think about Iraqis and this one on the left as cultural groups you can see if you read this um, essentially everyone hates everyone else Arabs view Kurds as Arabs view Kurds as separatists. Tension exists between Shia and Sunni Arabs. Kurds are openly hostile to Iraqi Arabs. Assyrians experience persecution. Chaldeans um, have peaceful relations with Turkmen. That's a good one. And Turkmen view themselves as a marginalized and repressed minority. There's a lot to be said here, but what I want to focus on right now is that, for example, a 26-year-old Marine um, who did signals intelligence and who served in Iraq twice, the second time working directly with, in his words, Iraqi officers and civilians, you know, these are the people that were <clears throat> given in, uh, this material and, 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 and told to use it. He reported to us the following, quote, I can tell you that the training itself definitely made you feel more comfortable. As far as the cultural training, history type stuff, like the difference between Shia and Sunni, it was important because it made me feel comfortable with the basics and let me grow from there. Or it comes in handy when, when the Marine sees something on the news and when they see something about the differences between Arabs and Christians, or Iraqis and Iranians, stuff like that. The Marine can tell their friends and family that they explain to them why there is such diversity in Baghdad and why the Sunni and Shia and Kurdish people are fighting each other. As this soldier and others expressed, uh, expressed, they feel more comfortable, that's his word, even if that knowledge is not relevant to their missions. Rather, the material is helpful for explaining what is actually happening in Iraq, they think. Journalists and other commentators then reproduced this framing that was, that was out there as factual. So journalist Al Kamen of the Washington Post in a July 20, 2006 post described the Iraqi culture smart card, card smart cards useful, uh, usefulness and explanatory power. Quote, the latest card which came out in May is so good that the section on cultural groups pretty much predicts the bloodshed of the past two months. So you can see how this material go, both gets, gets produced and then gets reproduced in various ways. These groups were not posited as groups, though, and I'm, this is me now talking. These groups were not posited as groups because they were products of political power, whether that was Saddam Hussein's favoritism or the political organizing that had gone on in secret and or in which took different forms. Rather, these groups were presented as inherent to what it means to be Sunni or Shia or Kurdish, and that this is the basis of democracy and political power in Iraq. So this political vision of Iraqis as uh, sectarian was the basis of US governmental policies as well. And one scholar wrote, quote, Paul Bremer, who administered the coalition provisional authority during the first year of the occupation, formed a 25-person Iraqi governing council in July of 20, 2003, which consisted of 13 Shias and five Arab Sunnis. This echoes what uh, Sinan said earlier. Quote, these actions reproduced a society in which affiliation to a communal group, not democratically inclined political leanings, determined access to power, unquote. This way of framing Iraqis as inherently sectarian was also mirrored in popular books being written and produced at the time. For example, um, in the Complete Idiot's Guide to Understanding Iraq, which came out in early 2003, before the invasion, Joseph Traeger asks, who will replace Saddam Hussein if he is overthrown? And he breaks it down in ethnic terms, not in terms of potential leaders or political movements. You can read the quotes there, because I don't have time. Um, that he chooses this framing of politics says more about how Americans sought to make sense of Iraq than any alleged Iraqi understanding of themselves. And it is as if the American understandings are the only way for Iraqi politics to be organized in a post-Saddam world rather than what Iraqis might want or by political parties or ideologies around leaders. Why is this a problem, you may be thinking. Um, because I think really, and what I try to show here is because it really assumed that sectar this kind of sectarianism was the only way that Iraqis, Iraq and Iraqis function. And then with that assumption, decisions were then made using that as a framework and the, or, the inter or, the, or was the interpretation of why something happened the way it did. And now I wanna get into kind of a, an even more insidious issue. Let me give you another example of the problem of this uber orientalist framing. The army, First Division uh, Infantry, the F Army First Infantry Division Soldiers Handbook to Iraq, first published in 2003, declared in a section called Arab World View this, that Iraqis desire for modernity is, quote, Ira quote, 
Iraqi's desire for modernity is contradicted by a desire for tradition, especially Islamic tradition, since Islam is the one area free of Western influence and uh, Western identification and influence. Desiring democracy and modernization immediately is a good example of what a Westerner might view as an Arab's wish versus reality, end quote. There's a lot to parse in these two sentences in terms of tropes and misinformation and Orientalism, which I think you're all familiar with. But this assessment of Arabs, Iraqis, Islam is also strangely and paradoxically counterproductive to the US mission. Because with this assertion, the handbook undermines one of the stated reasons why the US invaded Iraq in the first place, to overthrow Saddam Hussein and bring democratic rule to the country. So while the US administration finally sent Iraqis to the polls in January 2005, the handbook asserted that they were essentially incapable of it. How are Iraqis and US servicemen and women supposed to reconcile these contradictory messages? Or if they do try, what do they take away? As one Marine in our interview group commented, quote, now that Saddam is gone, they are somewhat free. I just hope they know what to do with it. I hope they have the infrastructure to make it work, end quote. This quote brings up one of the key tropes of soldiers' narratives about Iraqis, that they have been liberated, and thus Iraqis need to get with the program, need to be ready for it, and that they are responsible now, and that it is up to them. So at the same time soldiers were being told Iraqis are not ready, largely because of their worldview, and as the smart cards tell us, because they all hate each other, American soldiers were fighting to liberate them, and then hoping that Iraqis can know how to be free. Imagine the conundrum the soldiers faced in reconciling all of this. Moreover, what this framing of worldview sets up, as well as the soldier's articulation of his ideas about hoping that Iraqis are ready, is that if Iraqis fail in being democratic, they fail because they weren't ready for it, or they don't know what to do with it, or they desire democracy too soon. All of these options interpret the failure as Iraqis' own, and not the fundamental wrongness of the invasion or the occupation's policies or anything else. And even more than that, any resistance to the US invasion and occupation becomes seen as Iraqis refusing the freedom they've been given, and thus the justification for the continuing occupation. Nowhere in this cultural framing is there any space for a discussion of how the US presence may influence Iraqis. Instead, Iraqis are seen as static, unchanging, and, and, and sort of solidified in these ways of being Iraqi um, that are inherent to their cultural, ethnic, and religious identities. My conclusion, what do I see as the takeaway from this very limited um, analysis? As I mentioned at the outset, the ability of the US government to determine and to define the meaning of what was happening in Iraq as a sectarian conflict based on inherent Iraqi identities was all incredibly consequential for shaping American soldiers' interactions with Iraqis and for defining military policies and strategies and for determining US government uh, policies. I'm not saying that there wasn't sectarian conflict, but using it as the primary framework for the creation of, po of policy was a disaster for Iraqis, as we will hear and as we have heard, as well as for Americans, and they reflect re re reflect long-held hist histories of, of imperial rule. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rochelle. Uh, next, we are welcoming uh, Professor Joseph Sassoon. Joseph Sassoon is the director of the Center of Contemporary Arab Studies here at Georgetown University. Uh, he is professor of history and political economy uh, at the center and holds the Al Sabah Al Sabah chair in politics and political economy of the Arab world. He is also senior associate member at St. Anthony's College at Oxford. Please welcome Professor Sassoon. Thank, thank you, Bassam. Um, this research is actually done with a, a mass a graduate student who is now doing his PhD in Oxford, Mu'tasim Abu Zaid. Um, my talk is about the impact of the 2000 invasion on authoritarianism in the region rather than, you know, specific to Iraq, uh, as most of the other people are going to be talking. Great power intervention is integral to the contemporary history of the Middle East and its authoritarian trajectories. Thus, the 2003 invasion of Iraq was not an isolated episode, yet it stands out as its scale and its aftermath influenced Arab regimes and societies in ways that remain more distinct today than other wars or softer forms of global involvement. 
Um, I'm going to focus really about how the invasion strengthened authoritarian adaptation and practices. Differing aspects of this process, including regional polarization, securitization, sectarian ethnic manipulation, transferred counterinsurgency practices, and the expansion of carceral systems found unique expressions in the so-called rogue states that were on the United States list of democratization. Middle Eastern regimes varied in their capacity to translate their learning in the face of social and geopolitical pressures, yet these aspects had a lingering impact on autocratic well-being and revival post-2011. What were the forms of authoritarian durability prior to the invasion? I'm not going to dwell on it here, but suffice to say that countries in the region uh, infiltrate their populations unevenly, leaving traces of social and economic discrepancies beyond their collapse. And the case of new authoritarianism in post-2003 Iraq is exemplary of this trajectory. Western interests in the Middle East have hardly been homogeneous. Historically, U.S. foreign policy found its way in combating Soviet influence and preserving its oil interests, while requiring the maintenance of political stability of allies and the whole region, Core interest also included the so-called liberalization of Arab economies through international financial actors, as well as political liberalization by promoting democratic values and human rights. As such, political players in the regions learned how to navigate those contrasting pressures and turn constraints into opportunities. Yet the threat on an invasion of this scale was unprecedented. Arab leaders and bureaucrats were equipped to face neither the American hegemon nor popular threats to their rule should they align themselves with the occupying force. The position of senior figures in various Arab establishments reflected a great deal of uncertainty in the immediate aftermath of the invasion. A patent lie of ambiguity, for instance, emerged in Syrian narrative. On one hand, Syrian officials described American action as genocide, terror, war crime, expressed their approval of suicide missions against the U.S. On the other hand, the authorities welcomed a visit from Colin Powell and signaled to observers that Syria was ready to commit to further reforms, albeit gradual and restricted. The most notable and immediate consequence of Saddam Hussein's toppling is perhaps the Libyan nuclear disarmament. This was Gaddafi's gambit to set the record straight with the U.S., particularly given the sanctions on Libya and the U.S. pursuit of banned weapons. But at the same time, Libya denounced the wide mismanagement of Iraqi affairs and so-called bloody operations such as the killing of Husay and Uday Hussein. Iran doubled on nuclear weapons as, quote, the single durable guarantee against foreign intervention. The regime capitalized on anti-U.S. sentiments in the region, which have partially contributed to the election of conservative leaders there in Tehran to justify its growing domestic repression and military involvement in Lebanon. By the end of 2006, six Arab countries, Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, and UAE, declared their intention to acquire a nuclear capability for civilian purposes as Iran's intentions were revealed. As we all know, while the U.S. was well prepared for a military invasion, it was ill-equipped for the administration of Iraq. The occupation gave rise to various ideological groups, and the insurgency expanded and began to unfold into a prolonged and vicious conflict, resulting in the large-scale displacement of Iraqis. Despite setting up key institutions of Iraqi democracy, the U.S. had to gradually deprioritize democratic influences as they lost control of the security situation. Two trending polarization took place in the mid-2000s. 
The first was sectarianization along the Sunni Shia divide, as we heard, due to the debathification and dissolution of the army, the insurgency, and the civil war. The second polarization was of the anti-American and anti-Iran camps, which did not fall neatly along the lines of Arabs and non-Arabs. Instead, what emerged was more of a new Arab Cold War that revolved over the representation of so-called Arab interests between states such as Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia versus radical non-states like Hezbollah and Hamas that stemmed from social movements appealing to an Arab Islamic narrative. By 2005, Syria's stronger ties with Iran became critical in repositioning the state's relations and policies with its neighbors, and all attempts to isolate Syria failed. Similarly, Gaddafi gained significant confidence following the civil war in Iraq. He defended the resistance in Iraq and by 2007 backed the Iranian nuclear pre uh, project, countering his own stance of a few years earlier. And in response to any social pressure in Libya, Gaddafi would fall back on anti-US rhetoric. Iran, of course, emerged as the major winner of the invasion. Its authoritarian standing fared better, given its ideological, economic, and geopolitical prominence following the invasion. Iran actually achieved its two main goals. One, there were no more territorial threats from Iraq. And two, there was an ally government of Iraq sustained through several spheres of influence, such as loyal politicians, covert networks, and militias. And ironically, the U.S. got rid of Iran's two major regional nemesis, first, first the Taliban and then Saddam Hussein. The GCC regime's endeavor to remain intimate with, uh, ties with Washington against the demands of their respective population. But simultaneously, GCC would not establish uh, diplomatic missions or embassies throughout the region and hence, uh, and throughout the whole 2000 actually, and fell short in joining the efforts of building a stable and democratic statecraft in Iraq to check the Iranian influence. By the end of 2000s, Arab regimes employed a new mechanism of legitimization based on multiple polarization and structures of American militarism. The Arab uprising exposed the full spectrums of the regime's learning of authoritarianism. First, regime learned through a prolonged trial and error approach with the aim of diminishing the probability of collapse. There is, of course, no blueprint that guarantees durability, but a set of measures that the regime implements before and during uh, periods of upheaval. Second, it would be premature to assume that all learning is transformed into actual policy change. Rather, there are structural constraints on the transmission of authoritarian regime learning into policy changes. The robustness perspective that was relatively dominant in the 2000s failed to predict the Arab Spring, as we all know. Structurally speaking, certain elements such as oil wealth and dynastism may be sufficient to prevent an uprising or a revolutionary episode from achieving regime change due to the high level of loyalty in the coercive apparatus. After 2011, regional polarization evolved into a vacuum in global leadership. The result of these new alliances and contentions was the further securitization and militarization of all camps involved in what emerged as a new institutional assemblage of reg regional security. Key learnings took place here in terms of intelligence and security cooperation. The Abu Ghraib model inspired a number of regimes to adopt supermax prison as part of their primitive punitive measures. American prison officers and private contractors were involved in establishing a new civil penal system 
following the invasion, yet their policing grew increasingly indiscriminate and militarized. Construction and logistic companies from the U.S. and Canada followed suit in the design and implementation of U.S. Com coercive complex. And while the official number of prisons in the region is estimated to be over 1,600, many informal prisons were constructed by non-state actors such as Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, the Nusra Front. Sparking sectarianist conflict became a key tool for this group to thrive, something also used by other regimes as well as a defensive securitization tactic. ISIL learned from Hussein's authoritarian rule as a considerable number of its leaders were former regime figures and senior military members. Ultimately, regime change is not simple. Authoritarianism is rising globally and is still in good shape. Likewise, the most recent bar Arab Barometer survey involving 23,000 participants in nine Arab countries and the Palestinian territories showed that the majority of citizens across the Arab world are losing faith in democracy as a system of governance to deliver economic stability. Let me just conclude. Overall, it could be argued that the invasion sustained the durability of authoritarianism in the Middle East, albeit in disproportionate ways. Each state was liable to domestic and international pr pressures to reform, ushered by the fall of the regime in Baghdad. Yet, they all adapted over time as the repercussions of American intervention and dynamics of instability and war in Iraq unfolded. In fact, it was the countries designated by the U.S. for democratization, Iran, Syria, Libya, that experienced the most authoritarian upgrades. Additionally, the geopolitical polarization between the anti-American and anti-Iran -Ara -Ca camps served as a justification for increased securitization measures. Some of the spillover effect might overlap with the other two major wars around the same period, the war in Afghanistan and the larger global war on terror. The 2003 invasion was a critical juncture that altered both the U.S. hegemony and the regional balance of power for the following two decades. Middle Eastern regimes were already remarkable in their authoritarian resilience, and this resilience allowed them not only to survive threats in their vicinity, but to reap the state of insecurity left by the U.S. and consequentially exhaust its predominance in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sassoon. Uh, next, we are going to move to a uh, the next speaker who will be joining us over Zoom. It will be uh, Pete Moore. And let me make sure. Hello, Pete. How are you? Uh, good. I can hear you. Everything's working well. Very strange. Um, <laughs> I'm a big head on a screen. Uh, yes, we will. Uh, I will introduce you uh, briefly, and then I will uh, uh, leave you with the floor. Uh, Professor Pete Moore is the Marcus A. Hanna Associate Professor of Politics at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. From 2021 to 2022, he was the visiting Kuwait Chair at the Paris School of International Affairs, Sciences Po. He's also, like everyone else here, an old, older, old. Well, I don't want to say old colleague because he's, you know, it's not, I don't want to be ageist, but he's a colleague of ours for many, many years, and I'm very happy to uh, have him join us. Uh, please help me welcome uh, Professor Pete Moore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bassam. It's an honor to be on this panel, and I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you today in person. Um, <clears throat> Prior to the U.S. invasion, um, my interest in Iraqi politics evolved through a research project uh, to examine trade, uh, changes in trade between Jordan and Iraq. Uh, 
Um, I quickly learned, however, that it's difficult to isolate and study trade patterns uh, between countries, any countries in the world, without a much broader political economy uh, understanding of change. Uh, and of course, as been mentioned already, in the case of Iraq, that meant uh, dealing with decades of conflict and violent intervention. Um, working with a colleague, uh, Chris Parker at Ghent University, uh, we borrowed the concept of, an, of a war economy as a way to conceptualize uh, the complex shifts and struggles within Iraq's political economy before and after the U.S. invasion. Uh, this term war economy just briefly was developed in the middle of the 20th century to describe uh, the marshalling of national resources to, pr uh, to pursue interstate war. But by the 1990s, and particularly the early 2000s, the concept of a war economy had been applied broadly in the global South to try to understand market exchange within a context of violence. Uh, Christopher and mine's application of an Iraqi war economy was more specifically meant to capture a, a political economy in which the use of violence uh, was used to secure resources and assets, and those assets and resources were used to support the means and instruments uh, of violence. So what I want to do for the rest of my short presentation is to uh, briefly unpack the three sort of analytical lenses that we use to understand this war economy and then connect these to uh, some primary legacies of this war economy that we've seen uh, in the decades since and today. The first lens that we adopted was um, a historical understanding, uh, which is and this has been mentioned before, the invasion in 2003 was not a complete historical rupture uh, in Iraq's political economy. Uh, it was not a tabla rosa, but we started our analysis in the late 70s uh, and early 80s, specifically with the onset of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, the narrative that we adopted and, and crafted was to acknowledge a steady unraveling of central authority within Iraqi public institutions that were at the core of the country's domestic economy. Um, and this is an unraveling which we could we could chart and, and evidence within trade patterns in politics before 2003. Um, as well, this trend in political economic decentralization was largely mirrored uh, although we had less evidence of this, was, was largely mirrored in a similar decentralization of security and coercive institutions uh, in Iraq. And I'm going to talk more about this uh, when I get to legacies. The second major lens that we adopted in trying to understand this war economy was a regional and transnational lens uh, that Iraq's domestic struggles took place within a larger regional political economy. Prior to 2003 and in the immediate years after, uh, we focused on the linkage between Jordan um, and Iraq. Uh, these, were, these were each other's largest trading partners. Uh, this relationship was as equally important to political ec economic elites in Baghdad as it was in Amman, in, in the capital of Jordan. We traced these connections uh, before and after 2003 along Iraq's major road networks and import-export nodes. And we showed that there was a fairly significant correlation between uh, violent American uh, intervention in parts of Iraq along these roadways and around these import-export nodes. And indeed, many of the groups that resisted the American intervention also concentrated their effort to control these import nodes and important road networks uh, in within Iraq. The third lens that we adopted was to try to not simply focus on the types of predation and violent expropriation that was perpetrated by elites and their external sponsors, but also on how everyday Iraqis and Iraqi society and generally had been responding to this violence and this dislocation for decades. Um, the way we put it was that uh, Iraqi Ba'athists dominated this system, but clearly not under conditions 
of their own choosing. Before 2003, Iraqi civilians and parts of society had responded and adapted to this violence and intervention. We could call these survival strategies, avoiding, adapting, engaging. Um, and we tried to argue that these forms of survival could also be seen, sadly, as forms of agency that were helping perpetuate this war economy, um, keeping your head down, keeping your family safe uh, can also involve acquiescence to the very injustices of the war economy. And therefore, we reasoned, based on these three lenses, that we expected this war economy to survive long after the U.S. were to leave or at least shift its strategy on Iraq. And I might note that this is not to blame Iraqis. Uh, rather, it's to highlight the nature of a political quagmire in Iraq uh, and a violent quagmire in which um, there's no easy way out. So let me switch to the legacies uh, since, or, or another way to think about it is the endurance of this war economy since the early 2000s. So one clear legacy of this is the rise of new social groups, uh, new actors, new political economy networks, new geographic distinctions, not just within the country, but within the area and the region around Iraq. Of course, the most popularized of these actors have been the so-called non-state actors and movements opposed to the U.S. dominance. But other equally consequential groups that have embedded themselves or seized, a better way to think about this, I think, is a form of regulatory seizure in which parts of Iraq's formal public sector uh, have been divvied up, as Sinan mentioned earlier, by what looks by groups that resemble organized criminal groups. And I think this is important because this regulatory over, uh, uh, seizure has overlapped uh, with organized military and coerce, coercive institutions connected to the Iraqi state, not connected to the Iraqi state, deep connections to the United States, deep connections to other actors uh, in the region. A second major legacy of this war economy is something that our uh, colleague Dina Houri has called the unbuilding of the Iraqi state. And here I would, I would highly recommend her piece that was in the journal Catalyst a couple of years ago on the after effects of the US invasion. But this, this concept of unbuilding the Iraqi state, I think, is quite apt, because we see it in much of the statistical tracking data uh, that have emerged from Iraq since 2003. And much of it points to um, the socioeconomic sort of uh, side of this state unbuilding, which has been a developmental reversal, in some cases stagnation, but clearly in some cases developmental reversal uh, in Iraq. That this form of fiscal political decentralization, new competing centers of accumulation in Iraq uh, have added up to uh, an entire political and socioeconomic system that's moving not in a direction of uh, production and investment, but rather in a continued direction of decentralization and predation. Uh, as I hinted at, the origins of this can be traced to prior to the U.S. invasion. Uh, much of this decentralization was at first sparked by the emergencies of conflict, the Iran-Iraq War, uh, the, uh, the destruction after the liberation of Kuwait, and the ensuing brutality of the sanctions regime. We can see many of the regime reactions as their own form of coping and survival. Uh, by the 1990s, these decentralizations became clandestine. Much of the trade between Jordan and Iraq uh, that circumvented sanctions and that did not circumvent sanctions, that was just forms of um, smuggling and over-indexing over uh, exports, these forms of trade went clandestine. They went underground. And again, Again, I think this term regulatory seizure is a better way of thinking about this as opposed to sort of a passive unraveling. Um, these were struggles over control of assets and resources. Finally, the U.S. invasion we showed in many ways solidified, extended, militarized, and internationalized these seizures, uh, both for the benefit of American allies, but also, as we've seen, to benefit other regional actors in unforeseen uh, ramifications of the U.S. violence. 
Um, however, I would, I would. Uh, this is important to note that where we are today and in the last several decades of Iraq's political economy has not meant the disappearance of the Iraqi state or its public sac sector. Rather, it's, redi it's redirection um, and it's uh, form of adaptation to new political power. So let me just quote from a couple of reports. Uh, the first is from the London School of Economics about public sector employment that I think is quite important, which is that, quote, between 2003 and 2015, the core public sector in Iraq expanded from 900,000 to more than 3 million, providing approximately 42 percent of all jobs. Public sector employee salaries are the highest expenditure item in the government. So these forms of regulatory seizure have accompanied new forms of resource distribution in Iraq that are defined in ways that are not centralized, that are defined in local and uh, uh, that correspond to local forms of power. And then here's a 2020 World Bank report that I think is very antiseptic, but I'll conclude on this because I think it's quite damning for where Iraq finds itself today um, and what Iraqis have to deal with. Quote, although oil wealth has allowed Iraq to obtain upper middle income status, in many ways its institutions and socioeconomic outcomes have more closely resembled those of a low income fragile country. The Iraqi education system once ranked near the top of the Middle East and North Africa, now sits near at the bottom. Iraq's, Iraq's rate of participation in the economy is low, and the country has one of the lowest female labor force participation rates in the world, low levels of human and physical capital, deteriorating business conditions. Iraq has also one of the highest poverty rates among upper middle income countries. And on a purchasing power parity basis, GDP per capita in Iraq today is barely higher than it was in 2003. Um, it's very antiseptic, but it's clear that Iraq, the ramifications of this war economy have been broad and deep, and unfortunately, those effects do not show much dissipation in the current context. And on that point, I will conclude. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pete. Uh, you have 12 more seconds. Uh, you, you beat everyone by sticking to the time 100%. Thank you. Um, I am delighted at this point. To wait for my colleagues to sit down. I am delighted at this point to introduce our most junior and a remarkable member of this panel, and because his bio was the shortest, I'm going to read it all. <laughs> Omar Sili, Professor Omar Sili is a research associate in the Department of Politics and International <coughs> Studies at SOAS, University of London. He holds a PhD in political science from the University of Toronto. His doctoral dissertation, Scarecrows of the State, and ethnography of security checkpoints in contemporary Baghdad was named co-winner of the 2022 Malcolm H. Kerr Dissertation Award in the Social Sciences from the Middle East Studies Association. Mabrook, Omar, uh, please help me welcome Professor Omar Siri. Sorry, it's, it's Siri. Uh, you have to stress on the R's, but I have a genetic defect. I, I cannot do that. This professor wasn't in Ohio. <laughs> perform it into existence. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Sam. Michelle, I have to say, uh, it's great to, to learn what this gesture now means and this gesture, but I have to ask you, what, what does this gesture mean <laughs> among white women? I have no idea what the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, thank you um, to, uh, where's the, ah, here we go, perfect. First, thank you to CCAS, uh, George Mason uh, University, and of course the IASI, and particularly to uh, Bassam Haddad for the invitation to be here today. It's an honor to, uh, to join you all. About five and a half years ago, in October 2017, I moved to Baghdad to carry out uh, field work for my doctoral dissertation on security checkpoints in Iraq's capital city. Hardly there a couple of weeks, I stumbled on a banal event not far from my front door. 
laborers were paving a main thoroughfare on the edge of my neighborhood. I had only just arrived, but the roadworks felt important. Residents of Baghdad had for years criticized each and every post-2003 government for doing very little to improve their everyday living conditions. Electricity provision was poor, air quality was worsening, a range of urban infrastructures like water supplies and sewer systems were consistently neglected. What have they built since taking power is a rhetorical query commonly posed by citizens as they mock their politicians. This is to say nothing of the swellings of, physical uh, swellings of physical insecurity that have persisted throughout this entire century. Ebbs and flows of violence often anticipated by those who know viscerally what calms before storms really feel like. Residents in my neighborhood insisted to me with some combination of shock, anger, and relief that this was the first time since the invasion that a road was being paved in their area. It was, at the very least, a pleasant surprise. One they figured was occurring because an official in the local municipality was paid. Incentivized to prioritize their neighborhood for rudimentary infrastructural improvement. Either way, it was a win. The fresh asphalt was liberating for drivers and passengers alike, particularly among youth itching to put pedal to metal. Years of unfilled potholes brought about by scorching climate and conflict disappeared in 72 hours. Sedans, SUVs, minibuses, all of them began to fly across the long stretch of road, embracing a vehicular freedom hard to come by in a city that in recent years has been increasingly plagued by vicious and unforgiving traffic jams. Weeks after the road renewal, a school bus was dropping students off in the neighborhood one afternoon. A black sedan came speeding in from behind and sought to pass the bus. Its driver had not realized that the bus was sitting idle because a young 12-year-old boy, who I'll call Jasim, was, uh, was getting off. As Jasim stepped out in front of the minibus to cross the street, the car driver didn't see him in time. He swerved at the last possible second, first striking the young boy and then crashing left. The community consensus was clear. Jasim was lucky to survive. His multiple broken bones, the evidence. A few months later, in early spring, I left home and spotted something new laying in the middle of the street, a speed bump, or rather half a speed bump, extending from one side of the road seemingly cut in the middle. Made of heavy rubber, the black and yellow obstruction was bolted into the street. Later in the evening, I ran into Abu Ahmed, another local resident, and asked him about the speed bump. He quickly recalled the accident, the bad speed conditions. It's Mahmoud. He lives in the house in front of it. He's the one who laid it down, Abu Ahmed told me. He has young kids. He's, he's worried about them when they're out playing. This is uh, taken a month uh, later. As you can see, uh, he realized he needed to finish the speed bump, so added the, the second half. Spatial transgressions are commonplace in Baghdad. Checkpoints and concrete walls, barriers and barbed wire. Such materials have for, the most, for most of this century conditioned the mobility across Iraq's capital city. Variable government initiatives have in recent years sought to remove lots of this matter. Pronouncements made and actions taken most often in the run-up to federal elections. A top-down wink and nudge to voters that everyday life which for so long was defined by incessant insecurity, was slowly but surely becoming more livable. That it actually was not seemed less important to the vote seekers than givers. Those whose participation in post-2003 elections has veritably declined at a steady clip. The story of this speed bump, I confess, is a far more banal type of obstruction than Baghdad's checkpoints, which have long been my focus of research. But I suggest that it offers an avenue of reflection into perhaps less what has been destroyed over the last two decades, and rather what has and has not been built. You can, you can purchase speed bumps at shops along uh, Baghdad's storied Shah Rashid, Rashid Street, once home to Orezdi Beg, what many claim was the first shopping mall in the Middle East about a century ago. 
Today, the street is more emblematic of the neglect still plaguing Baghdad's rich architectural history. Construction, construction goods shops occupy the ground floor of a number of heritage buildings on Shah Rashid. For those searching for the most basic of bumps, two decent options exist. A choice between Chinese-made and Turkish-made. How much for these, I recently asked a not-yet-teenage boy on shift at one of the shops. 20,000 dinar per meter for the Turkish, 16,000 for the Chinese, he replied. But go with the Turkish, he insisted. Better quality. More advanced, indeed more sinister options also exist. When I first went in search of speed bump shops one, uh, a few years ago, one seller offered me the version with metal spikes, as you can see here. These rubber metal hybrids are far more expensive, in the range of 90 to 120 USD per meter, largely because they are far more co coercive. These street knives turn two-way streets into one way, drive over them the wrong direction, in the wrong direction, and they gash open your tires. I asked the salesman then if it was even legal to lay these down. He paused for a brief moment and then snapped a reply. I guess it depends on who you are. I pressed him on what quickly became a commentary on political power in the Iraqi capital, indeed across the country. But these are the public streets. Should this not all be the job of the government, I asked? Should the state be, shouldn't the state be responsible for speed bumps on public roads? The man was confounded not by my question, but with my absurdity. He blinked once, and then deadpanned. Mu'ayb, leish taqlat. Shame on you. How could you think that? We have for years been told about the destruction of the Iraqi state, the unbuilding after 2003. We long ago accepted there is a laundry list of quote-unquote mistakes, crimes perhaps might be a better apt, a uh, better word. U.S. forces and coalition provisional, the coalition provisional authority made that helped facilitate the failure of the very democratic institutions the occupiers insisted would flourish. To say nothing of the renewed authoritarianism that exacerbated disenfranchisement and huge swaths of the country in the lead up to the rise of the so-called Islamic State. These broad assessments, even if accurate, are too general, too committed to policy considerations, and thus too often miss the myriad of devils in the details. These analyses, while critical, cannot, indeed are uninterested in capturing how these political conditions come about through and in turn affect people's everyday lives. Put differently, one question animating my interests here is, how do citizens navigate mundane facets of everyday life? And what, qu what can quotidian social practices tell us about politics about not simply physical destructions, but social and political creations over these withering two decades. A central answer revolves around the vacating of the public, public interests and public goods as a praxis of Iraqi governance and political life. <laughs> We are well aware of the free market ideologies that were introduced by occupying authorities and diasporic elites and embedded into state institutions after 2003. We are well aware of the corruption and embezzlement and money laundering that has helped pilfer hundreds of billions of dollars from public coffers. We are well aware of how newly established private banks have for years been the main beneficiaries of US dollar auctions that have literally been a license to print money helping bring about astronomical windfalls that are in turn implicated in the shocking heights that property prices have recently reached in Baghdad and elsewhere. That these political economic practices persist is certainly objectionable, giving us a small sense of the mechanisms through which a coterie of elites have made billions on the backs of the people they purport to represent. But such a focus still does not tell us very much of the social effects at street level, literally and metaphorically. And I think even serves a far too neat analytical binary between elites and masses that in recent years has gained greater credence. At the same time, we often accept at face value pop popular expressions that speak to us viscerally. The state is corrupt, the state is weak, there is no state at all. Similarly, such lamentations, even if they ring true, 
still do not always capture what these conditions actually look like, how they work, what they help to create. By turning to the banal, it is not simply that we get a better sense of the nuances of politics. Rather, I am suggesting that mundanity, as inconsequential as it may seem, is far better at capturing the kinds of governance practices being created, the new forces of rule that surely have a much longer half-life than the spectacular violence that almost always gets far more attention. If the state is non-existent, or at the very least does not work for the people, the public, how are necessary governance practices and provisions ascribed to it carried out? Mahmoud's experience offers a clear, uh, a clear answer. If I want to protect my kids, I'm gonna buy my own speed bump. Three years ago, and I'll, clo and I'll close here, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, predominantly youth from central and southern Iraq, engulfed the streets of their towns and cities calling for the downfall of the political system through which they are governed and misgoverned. The slogan of the movement, Nri Watan, we want a homeland, was powerful. It spoke to so many, what so many thought they had lost. Indeed, what so many born in the aughts had never felt they ever had. I wonder though if this literal translation misses the mark on what is being called for, what is being politically fought for. The revolutionaries, to be clear, were not under any illusions of what they were up against. We're not uh, under no false consciousness of what they were fighting for. I instead mean to suggest that what may be more at stake in their unfinished struggle for a homeland is a battle for a public, as a conception, as a collective, as a body for which government anywhere is to work. Years of for-profit governance have privatized, in the most expansive sense of that term, social life. The road back to a semblance of public is an arduous one. Its speed bumps are but one worry to the extent that those protesting for new futures can and will bowl over still more daunting obstructions will likely depend on the form and function of their collective action on which any sustained public force is always built. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Omar Sidi. trying. Uh, I guess I could, I could, uh... thank you all, thank you. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Thank you all very much for um, joining us uh, for this first part. We will move on to the Q&A period. I have a few questions that have been uh, sent to us. We are also taking questions from uh, the audience and uh, online. Um, let me also say before we uh, start the Q&A period that this is a part of a project that uh, the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, the Middle East and Islamic Studies uh, program at George Mason University, well, the first centers at Georgetown and the Arab Studies Institute are embarking on uh, as a project. So it will include today's events, which involve uh, two panels and a screening of the film with a third panel later on today after lunch. But it also involves a series of podcasts that have been uh, initiated already, uh, one of which was with Kali Rubai on the environmental uh, consequences of the occupation of Iraq and so on, uh, and others as well. It will also involve, within a short period of time, after the conference is concluded and the podcasts are concluded, we are we are hoping that this will happen in April, a resource portal online that will include not just what happened during this project, but it will also include a myriad of resources on the question of Iraq uh, since and before 2000. And three, and the URL, uh, which is now not active, is uh, the very straightforward title: theinvasionofiraq.com. So you cannot forget it. Uh, 
theinvasionofiraq.com. So please feel free to visit soon, and it will be replete with uh, material that you can use as educators, researchers, journalists, and uh, students, and so on. Uh, let me start by um, actually uh, asking a, a general question that I hope that uh, most of the panelists can uh, address. And it is the following. After this question, I will actually sit down and I'll ask the rest of the questions from my seat. I'm just letting you know so you can just be prepared. Why is it so difficult slash political to get any kind of estimate on the number of dead from the invasion, I'm assuming, and after? Estimates vary widely, according to the person asking the question, from 100,000 to 1 million. So I'll start with that, and if we can, unless there is a, um, a pass, let's try to go with the order of the speakers. So we'll start with Sinan, and then Rochelle, and then uh, Joseph, then Pete, and then Omar. So everyone will ask us questions? You can choose. Uh, I mean, briefly, uh, you know, at the early days of the war, General Tommy France was asked about Iraqi civilians, and he said, we don't do body counts. Uh, I think a very short answer is that Iraqi lives don't matter, but another answer is that actually, even the conditions in Iraq, which all of us on the panel have tried to show, is that this is impossible even to to count. Also, there is a problem in the way that the deaths are counted, because there is also the, those who die indirectly because of the war. But ultimately, Iraqi lives don't matter. That's what I tried to say about the frame. And saying simply, we don't do body counts, um, they don't count. I would only add, um, I think in the global war on terror, there was a way of um, really separating people into t sort of terrorists and combatants and civilians. And when terrorists or combatants died, um, that was anybody who, and this particularly happened under the Obama uh, administration, they were called military aged males and that was anybody from sort of age 15 to 60. And so if you were a man and you happened to die in a US attack, um, you were oftentimes just categorized as a combatant. And so that also complicated the ways in which counting became uh, ways to show American success on the war on terror and to um, sideline also civilian um, casualties and, and the incredible damage that happened. Um, I think that you need to figure out what Sin, uh, Sinal was saying about the indirect result is really critical because of lack of, of medical aid. But also during the Civil War, don't forget what was going on between the different militias and groups. And a lot of those definitely did not get counted. So I would say whatever the number is, the, the direct and indirect, my guess, is, is higher than any estimates you see. I'll pass it. Uh, Pete, how can we get? Yeah, I would just say uh, I would just say briefly. Um, the, yeah, the, the controversy is around uh, not wanting to count indirect casualties, and I would just say that you know, in, in the state I'm living in, Ohio, we had that horrible uh, chemical spill in this town called East Palestine. That's how they pronounce it here, um, and already. People in that community and people in Ohio recognize that the costs of that spill and the physical, mental, and social effects will extend for decades in that part of Ohio. And many of the law claims and, and, and claims for accountability will come years from now. But, and so I think it's quite um, extraordinary that when the U.S. military also pollutes other parts of the world, um, that accountability uh, is, is avoided. And I think that's part of the politics for why there is so much pushback over uh, having indirect casualties. And the number from the British is at least a million in the, Lancet, the last Lancet study, um, why there's so much resistance to accepting uh, indirect casualties. But Sam, can I add one, just one? Uh, I'm Go sorry, ahead. you already had your chance. <laughs> <laughs> 
2016, one of the most vicious uh, car bombs happened, uh, post-2003 car bombs happened in Karada Dakhil um, as, in July of 2016. Estimates uh, of those who were killed in that um, truck bombing uh, ranged between 324, which is the official number, and 450, uh, which were, were told to me in, in interviews by um, senior uh, politicians and others. So two points on this. One, uh, Iraqi authorities uh, in these kinds of instances themselves who are on the ground can't, uh, don't necessarily, uh, are, aren't necessarily able to count these numbers, in part in that incident because uh, a number of um, people who were, who, were, who were killed in that bombing, who were celebrating both the end, the end of Ramadan and, um, and the end of exams, uh, uh, burned to death in the building, in the ensuing fire. Why they burned to death was because the, the building that was constructed had one entry and exit point in the center of the building. There were no uh, fire escapes. Uh, there was no way out. And so they burned to death. And so if we're taking seriously the uh, point around unbuilding of the state, Dina Khoury's uh, line, Pete's uh, comments earlier around the state, how do we, how do we not count uh, those deaths as part of uh, the aftermath of war, as part of the numbers of people who were killed, when the state can't even, as the state as such, can't even uh, enforce building regulations that are on the books, don't care to, and, in, and that is what was built after 2003. So I would make the argument that they are victims of war, uh, of this invasion of this whole enterprise. And I uh, would love to hear arguments against, but I, I likely would not be convinced. Thank you, uh, Omar. Uh, before I move to the second question, let me ask if anyone here um, in the audience would like to ask questions. We have awesome people ready to share the microphone with you if you'd like to ask a question. So we have one person. Thank you. Please identify yourself if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shano. Uh, I am from Iraqi Kurdistan. I am a graduate student first year at Mass. Uh, my question is mostly for a comment that Sinan Anton made. I want to say thank you so much for bringing attention to the uh, 1991, the invasion, uh, the occupation of Kuwait, the sanction, because most of the times these are uh, overlooked in these conversations. Uh, you mentioned that the supporter of U.S. invasion uh, were people from liberal and elite platforms. Um, I want to say from a per perspective of what we call in, the, in this field ordinary people, from that perspective, I want to ask uh, how is it possible to ordinary people in Iraq to revolt or protest against Saddam Hussein while there was no telecommunications, uh, internet, cell phones, um, any kind of satellite, everything was banned under Saddam Hussein, only uh, local channels uh, that uh, w most of the times they would like uh, have speeches of Saddam Hussein. Um, so there was isolation between Iraqi people and the other countries. Also inside Iraq, there was no way to protest. So my question is, was it possible for Iraqis to do anything without the intervention of U.S. Um, from my understanding, even the very few people that were mostly intellectuals and scholars that were opponent to Saddam Hussein, they were fle forced to flee the country. Uh, and my, because I feel like the uh, the fact that the U.S. invasion was not initiated by Iraqi people is not a valid uh, situation for the fact, uh, for all the other factors involved, uh, including the, what I mentioned, the lack of telecommunications. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Before uh, Sinan and uh, others, if they'd like to answer, uh, can start. Let me just say that we have 15 minutes, so I would like to ask of the um, uh, panelists to uh, just be mindful of that so that we can accommodate. We have uh, at least two more questions and perhaps another from the audience coming in. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, um, sorry. Uh, sure. no, until you, until you don't, don't, don't touch it, don't touch it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, uh, look, uh, if you, sorry to toot, if you watch our film later, you realize that of course there were some Iraqis in 2003 inside Iraq who 
took the U.S. seriously and believed that maybe this will help them build a better country. But that didn't happen. But very important to remember, in 1991, after, during the withdrawal of the Iraqi army from Kuwait, Bush Sr. got on radio and said, I call on the Iraqi people to take matters into their own hands. And courageous Iraqis in most of Iraq's 18 provinces actually staged uh, an uprising. And I was living there, and this is, you know, for three, four days, the Iraqi state disappeared in a way. The, uh, the coercive apparatus, the security cars disappeared from Zayuna, close to where I lived. Uh, there was nothing officially. But in the ceasefire agreement signed in the Safwan tent, the Iraqi army asked for, a, 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 agreed to everything. Yes, 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 yes. They just asked the Americans to use uh, helicopter choppers. Uh, so they asked supposedly to transfer the wounded. And General Schwarzkopf agreed. But later he was shocked that those choppers were used to completely crush and decimate the uprising and kill th tens of thousands of people who were buried in mass graves in southern Iraq. And later these mass graves are uncovered to, of course, tell us about the barbarity of Saddam, but not about how the United States had defanged the Iraqi regime, had really eliminated it as a, a, as a regional power, but they actually also decimated most of the, of the soldiers, draft soldiers in the Iraqi army, but kept the Republican guards because they knew that the Republican guards were actually the buffer to protect the regime. Saddam Hussein got the message and after three days of silence, appeared on the radio and warned all of his enemies about what he was going to do. So before Twitter, before Facebook, before that, tens of thousands of Iraqis protested. Even in Baghdad, there was graffiti saying, Yasqut Saddam. But time and time again, as we have seen later in Syria and elsewhere, people who are very desperate believe the slogans of liberal democracies, and then they're let down and then slaughtered and forgotten. Sorry, All right. Too long, but... No, absolutely. Uh, we will move to the second question, which is also broad, and feel free to uh, pass uh, if you would like to. Uh, and it's actually pretty uh, interesting. Didn't the 2005 Constitution enshrine sectarianism along the Lebanese model and uh, market it as representative democracy in quotation marks? Would Iraqis need to rip that Constitution to get a fresh start? Sinan, do you want to? Sinan passes. Everybody's passing. I'll, uh, I'll say something very briefly. Um, to me, what's important about, about the, the document is the process. So the uh, constitutional process that occurred in 2004 and 2005 was, uh, uh, was led primarily by the, by the US uh, government and a coterie of Iraqi diasporic elite who wrote, uh, uh, first of all, wrote the transitional administrative law, the TAL, the interim constitution in 2004, which was supposed to be the basis for the process in which a, uh, a permanent constitution would be written in 2005. What ends up happening is that the, um, the most of the Tal text, which was written by a handful of people led by the Americans, became, uh, for the most part, the bulk of the Iraqi constitution and in, in the permanent constitution in 2005. Uh, the final compromises of that document were made uh, quite literally in, in Mutbakh, okay, the kitchen of like a handful of uh, Iraqi political parties, uh, uh, you know, led by uh, the prominent uh, Shia political parties and the Kurdish political parties and a single uh, Sunni political party. I mean, this is what, again, let's not forget the ethno-sectarian context that was kind of created at that po point, where they brokered a kind of bargain uh, for the kind of last uh, issues of debate for the, for the document. The final version of that document was not released to the public in the referendum in, two, in October 2005 until two days before the referendum. Right? So the idea that this document uh, was representative of, uh, of the constituent power, if you take constitutional theory seriously, of the constituent power, the people, right? it, it simply was not. So uh, we can debate the ways in which ethno-sectarian uh, governance was you know, enshrined in the document itself or um, you know, more informal uh, Lebanon and the you know, Lebanonization of the country in the same, I mean, these comparisons are very clear, very uh, apt and pertinent, but it's the process of that constitutional, the constitutional process 
uh, and the kind of the joke that it was, frankly, uh, how short it was. There was a moment which they could have extended that process to make it longer for more buy-in, for more political participation amongst a whole host of uh, uh, parties, and they chose not to extend that process. And it is, I don't think, any coincidence that four months after the passing of that document, less than four months, you had the massive bombing of the uh, Askari Shrine in, in February 2006, which is seen as the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the bigger spark of, uh, of, of civil strife between parties uh, that led to um, the kind of descent of further discontrol or uncontrol of Baghdad for the better part of a year and a half. Just to add to that, the whole concept was so faulty from the beginning that you're going to have a <laughs> parliament based strictly not on political affiliation, but strictly on, 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 on uh, sect or religion. And interestingly, in the first draft that was presented, whoever did it by the population came back with 51% representation for women because that's the percentage of the population. But of course, that was changed, <coughs> dramatically reduced, but not the other uh, allocations to Sunnis and Shias. Just to add quickly, but some if those are interested in further understanding that whole process, Zaid Al Ali has a book on on this. Uh, yeah. Was involved in the uh, in the process uh, in 2004 and 5. Highly recommend uh, recommend the book. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> we have one more question, and then if there is anyone in the audience, I have to stand up because I can't see this side. If there's anyone, this looks really weird. I'm going to sit down. Is there anyone on this side of the room who would like to? Okay, so we have a question from Fida, and then a final question for Rochelle from on the online um, uh, audience. I'm going to ask the first question <coughs> to uh, Rochelle, and then we will we will end with uh, Professor Adley's question. Uh, so the question to you, Rochelle, and before I, I, say, I ask it, let me just say that in response to the question here, this afternoon uh, when uh, Sinan and I and our colleagues will be uh, screening the film about Baghdad, we all were in Baghdad, uh, let me just say that while the country was burning and uh, the destruction was all around us, the reporters from the New York Times and Chicago Tribune and other newspapers were meeting with us trying to ask us for leads of where to go, what to do, and who to speak with. And all they were interested in was the Iraqi constitution and when will it be um, uh, uh, you know, drafted. All right, so uh, the question to Rochelle, this was supposed to be a, an ironic uh, uh, comment, yes. Uh, the question to Rochelle is, how many scholars were involved in the human terrain system in Iraq? Which kind of scholars, political science, anthropology, etc., found it useful for their academic career? And um, after you respond, uh, Fida, we'll, we'll go to your final question because we do need to um, uh, conclude uh, so that Coco doesn't uh, 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 hurt me. <laughs> Yes, and thank you, Coco, who opened uh, us from the back um, for making all of this possible. And I also, just as a note, love that there's flowers here because if you ever go to a big event in Iraq, it's always surrounded by flowers. And so it's a very nice touch that it feels like we're kind of in solidarity with our Iraqi, um, with the Iraqis that we are, we are talking about. Um, about the human terrain systems, there's lots of books and lots of articles written on this. Um, not many people with PhDs who were in academic institutions joined the human terrain system. Um, they paid people a lot of money to sign up for this for a year or two years or whatever, more money than I make now as a professor at Georgetown. I'll just put that out there. Um, <laughs> that's not saying something about Georgetown. That's saying something about how much the human terrain system was, was willing to pay people. Or maybe it's saying something about both. Um, in any case, um, I think uh, it was, I think it appealed to a lot of people. I don't think it um, spawned many people's careers, certainly not in academia, and it certainly didn't push them in other places. It was widely derided um, by the military. The system was widely derided by um, by people. The I, I I think the picture that I had up showed someone from the human terrain team that you couldn't actually know they were from the human terrain team because they were wearing a military uniform, and so it became much more deeply embedded in the military than I think um, people anticipated maybe. And 
there was a real turn in the military against what they called this touchy-feely way of doing, um, of doing military work. And so it was never really seen as a success, and I think it never really, um, it never really um, caught on. A number of human terrain team members were killed in, in, um, in attacks or bombings or other sorts of things, and that was also uh, a bit of a blight on its record as well. So it, it died a death, it has yet to be revived, and it did not um, do really well for anybody, um, Iraqis and Afghans uh, included. Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, Fidel's question. I was going to ask two questions, but I feel like maybe we only have time for one for that. So long as you deal with Coco, I'm totally fine. <laughs> um, I'll just ask the one. Um, so I, I was, and maybe this is for Pete, but for everyone else too, but it's kind of related to, to your presentation, Pete. Um, I'm just interested in kind of like, like right now, like current U.S. economic interests in Iraq and how the um, kind of like terms of the um, like the post-invasion kind of terms of agreement with Iraq has facilitated like U.S. investments or U.S. economic interests in Iraq? Um, that's a good question. I'm not, the, the, the part about U.S. involvement in Iraq that I uh, followed most closely is uh, not actually investments, but rather American um, connections to the Iraqi Trade Bank and the effort of the United States to monitor and control um, uh, U.S. dollars that flow in and out of the country and the suspicion the Americans have that the Iraqi financial system is used by countries and interests that the United States sanctions. Um, and I think that that relationship is very deep. Uh, it remains one of the aspects of American um, involvement in Iraq's uh, financial system. Um, but as far as the broader investment, no, I haven't followed that as, as closely. Um, uh, the economic winner of the war is not the U.S. in 20 years later, it's China. Uh, and, and then, uh, as I mentioned, politically Iran, but definitely China, if you look at the size of the contracts, especially in oil, which is the main commodity, it's the Chinese and not the Americans. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Let me just say before I let you go that uh, we have to extend a, a, a major um, uh, set of gratitude to the people who have actually, behind the scenes, uh, did so much of the work to make this possible. Uh, please help me uh, thank Coco Tate and Dana Dirani. And all the people who are joining us today from CCAS and helping us logistically with the work, as well as, of course, our esteemed panelists and uh, even those who joined through Zoom, uh, we are very thankful to all of you.